Hey Ramble Force, welcome back to another episode of the Digital Ramble. This is episode 86 with myself, Chris Campbell, and my co-host in Houston, Texas, JJ Cannon. Chris Campbell, so excited to be back on the air with you. And today we have just an absolutely fantastic guest, Ben Russo with Ben Russo Design. Super excited to have him on the show. Yeah, and not to confuse anyone, we've got somebody from the UK calling in to the show from the West Coast in California. So not to throw you any curveball, I know we've had a lot of UK accents on the show recently, but uh, Ben's calling in from, from California. And Ben Russo, his designs are, are iconic, JJ. We've got to, you know, research and learn more about Ben's design. And this, you know, Ben's been in the game for nearly 20 years now. Yeah, man. Incorporating lighting with furniture as well as de design. And this interview is really special. And so, friends, we want to encourage you to stay till the end because his nuggets that he drops at the very end are just just spectacular. For those of you that are new to the Digital Ramble Show, I'm JJ Cannon, CEO of Digital Delight, uh, where we create uh, technology experiences for uh, small businesses as well as homeowners. You can check us out at digitaldelight.com. My name is Chris Gamble, owner and co-founder of Customized, a Norfolk in the UK based business, specializing in smart home with a sensible price tag. Go and check us out at customize.uk.com. If you are interested in checking out some of our previous shows, check us out at digitalrambleshow.com uh, where you can find any of previous shows on uh, YouTube, uh, on Facebook. We are featured on 11 different podcast streaming services. All right, JJ, let's get into this episode because this one is fire. And that's a clue. Stay tuned. It is fire. <laughs> Digital Ramblers, welcome back to the show. We have a very special guest today, designer Ben Rousseau from Ben Rousseau Design. How are you, my friend? I'm very good. Thanks, JJ. Thanks for having me. Good to you see know, you, Ben. So, Ben, uh, thanks for, for joining us today. I know that uh, you probably have a really busy schedule, but if you would, please tell our audience a little bit about yourself uh, and the design, you know, uh, the design community that you're a part of. We understand that it's a lot to do with uh, lighting and art and furniture. Let, let me yeah. stop talking. You go ahead and tell, tell us about yourself. Yeah, well, I uh, thank you. I set up the business in 2001 and that started off with kind of furniture, very modern furniture that had lighting integrated into it because my the direction that I wanted to go in was like hospitality design for nightclubs and hotels. Um, when I left uh, design college or university, uh, I went to Middlesex in North London and I did a range of furniture using beautiful uh, materials. I, I call them kind of your, your, the luxury materials, beautiful woods and acrylics and metal finishes. But I, I incorporated a lighting element to them um, just because in my late teens and early 20s, I was spending a lot of time DJing and going to parties and putting on my own little gigs and designing my own little DJ booths and lighting props and artworks to go on for our gigs. And as the more time we spent in nightclubs and bars and hotels, you know, the more I was thinking, you know, my design eye was like this. this there's a, there's a gap for something much more beautiful. You know, nightclubs are all a bit rough and ready and they're dark and dingy, but actually there was a, an element where, like, you know, you've got VIP rooms and people want to be entertained and people want to spend a bit more money and you want, it's taking it up a level. And I could, you know, I could see a, a, a gap where design could just help make the experience more classy and cooler. And, you know, I had a vision of how to, I don't know, not so much a vision, but you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I set up a company when I was 24, not so much as with a big business plan, but with an ambition and a drive that, you know, I had contacts and a, I just, I wanted to create stuff and I was out in the right places and meeting interesting people. Um, I did a show in Milan um, after I did the, the new designers show after Middlesex University. Um, and I had this, this one coffee table, which I created 
and it had this beautiful UV illuminated tray around the bottom. So I was using this lovely black American walnut and that was a dark brown timber, but then the contrast between the light underneath the timber, you know, it was just so sexy and it was so simple. And I was just like, right, this is, you know, there's something really in this. There's beautiful materials that are familiar with people in a kind of design environment that people recognize as good quality material executed and engineered in a beautiful way so you know the detail the finishing was crisp the the, you know, the design was modern you know I, I strictly do modern design but um uh so i launched this table at, or i was invited to represent middlesex university at the new designer show uh that got some good attention and then i was invited to do a show in milan um luckily um i met someone there who wanted me to do a bar in their living room so i then created this um unused it was very small so i mean i say a bar it was like a, he had a reasonably big living room in a pretty cool architectural house just outside of london and um i built this uh, beautiful bar with rustic wood and behind the behind the timber panels were these deliberately chosen you know, splits in the wood so the light shines through the splits and it was a really simple detail but it's so effective and uh customers still got it and you know 20 odd years later on it's still timeless looks beautiful and um i yeah i just it it, it, it was that combination of beautiful materials beautifully put together and having this ingredient i call it or it's my, like my secret weapon putting lighting into things it's just such a wow factor you know the i could have built the bar for this client with without the lighting and it would still look beautiful and i remember doing a presentation to the customer because when you're explaining to a customer how lighting is going to benefit their project most people 99 percent of people cannot imagine how how it's going to make a difference and so i made this prop which basically was a they're, they're, they're french oak floorboards and they're all distressed and old, but they have these splits in the wood. And I made this panel and I said, right, this is the design of the bar, turn the lights out. And so I had him turn the lights out and I switched a, a little panel with lighting in. So the blue light was shining through the splits. And, and I said, and this is what, this is what the whole thing is going to look like when, uh, when you switch the lights on. I said, now, now have a look. And he opened his eyes and it was in the dark and this blue light was shining through these cracks in wood and he was like oh my god i totally <laughs> get it yes amazing do it you know and so i've been lucky enough to have customers that share my um imagination or they um you know i think they they buy into my passion for what i want to do and luckily now more people have seen what i do so it's a kind of an easier sell whereas at the beginning people were just buying into my enthusiasm because you know i didn't have a huge amount of work to show people but as it as, a, as i got more pieces together um it it became uh, an easier sell so i mean in london uh, i was in london for 16 years i mean i've been in california for three years now and um you know i don't have the same word of mouth network whereas in england i had a you know much bigger word of mouth network um, i had a workshop towards the end um, and we built a lot of stuff, anything from individual furniture pieces that moved on to uh, full interiors, full houses. Uh, you know, part of the work was commercial, um, part of it was residential. Um, I was working for a number of agencies uh, where we'd, we'd build exhibition stands, we'd actually make props and stuff for gaming companies and artwork. So, actually, you made you know a really really broad range of things have done vehicles we did a we did a truck for samsung for the olympics which followed the olympic torch around which had two huge led screens in the back and you know with some of the agencies they knew that i did a lot of stuff with lighting and technology and you know my 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 biggest uh, uh my, my i suppose my biggest skill is my imagination and my design aesthetic and then I've got a good um, skill of finding specialist people that can help me put my designs together. So I work with uh, prop makers, um, you know, custom car builders, um, sculptors, other artists, you know, it, you know, specialist engineers, you know, it's certain stuff needs a certain person. And I would normally go to, you know, who's the best guy at making this stuff? You know, what, 
what do I need here? Okay, it's uh, okay. This needs a special um, panel to slide up. So I, you know, I need some electronics. I need, you know, I need a control system. You know, I need someone that's used to building almost robotics. And you know, it's always coming back to film prop makers because you know they get involved in all sorts of things. So you know, I. Uh, I, I owe a lot to the guys that helped me produce stuff. So yeah, to, in a nutshell, business covers everything from artwork, furniture, exhibition stands, a um, uh, lot of residential interior stuff because there's so much involved in an interior. So can design everything from how the flooring looks to kitchen cabinets, fitted, uh, fitted media stations. So a, a big thing I've been doing for many years is kind of like a custom leather clad media cabinet with uh, you know sliding panels and you know very much the the, the male customer that I, I, I tend to serve is, is the guy that loves all the James Bond gadgets <laughs> um, they like they like the tricked out stuff and you know I set the business up really um, for the future you know we live in the modern age and people find it hard to celebrate using technology. You know, there's technology to help make things efficient. Um, you know, we can control lighting better to make it use less power and effectively make it more efficient. So, you know, if you, like in California, you've got your solar, solar panels to help run your electricity in your house and effectively your house can, you know, be, uh, you know, is, is you're, you're not paying any electric bills because you've got it all coming from the roof. And, um, you know, the lighting equipment is now more efficient, so it uses less power. Convincing people to, to kind of spend that money sometimes is, is you know, is, where, is probably the harder part of the job. But I think when people now see what technology can do and the way that you can design with technology now, um, you know, it's great for my business and great for um, creating special interiors but you know that so i want to do things for the future i want to take design i want to take people's lives into the future i want to take make things better more efficient um so yeah that's what i want the business to do and and do you think ben that that use of technology that's maybe been one of the reasons why you've been so relevant and and in the spotlight and current and you know i've had this continued success do you think it's because you've involved and blended lighting the technology behind the lighting um, whereas others may not have embraced technology you, you sound like you embraced it early on you're talking about a, nearly a 20 year in business yeah. record and, and technology has been there from day one yes you know i the, the 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 thing for me with lighting when i was putting lighting to furniture the first design that i did you know i was using fluorescent bulbs and at that time you know, then, then discovered LED tape and it was like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it was just equipment becoming smaller and more efficient and less cables to run. And, you know, it was like, oh, wow, well, if I'm designing tables with lights in, I now need, I now need Wi-Fi power. You know, I was thinking, you know, how can, I'm thinking, well, to improve my designs, what technology do I need to make my designs better? You know, if I'm designing a nightclub, and all the tables are plugged in, you know, they're, they're either cables that need to be fed through the floor, and that's, if we're retrofitting a project, that could be expensive to be running cables to every table, or if we've got a special battery, you know, the batteries are now so good that you can charge them up in the daytime, and then the nightclub opens, and all the tables are lit up for the, for the event, and, or from, what, 8 till 4 a.m., whatever they're open, so, yeah. you know, it's, there was a need, I'm designing stuff with a need for the technology to support my design. So of course I'm looking for new stuff to help my designs be better and more efficient and inev inevitably easier to install and use. Um, you know, like now, you know, with certain Wi-Fi switching and stuff, you know, there's less, you know, it's less difficult retrofitting projects. You know, to be honest, I've uh, been lucky enough to work on a few new builds recently where, you know, we can plan exactly what i want from absolute day one which is you know it's, it's it's brilliant but um it just means it's a much better job whereas some people come to me and say you know oh we really want to do this but you know the hard part of the job is the rewiring and the damage and everything else that that kind of causes but you know it's worth it and, and that um, that can put people off that you know exactly you, that you can That's, reduce that friction you know with a wireless it. option and that, that again is something that takes them over a, a hurdle that can sometimes stop projects. 
Absolutely. So, you know, I like to think that uh, technology is is helping me. You know, I'm obviously looking for it, but I'm also looking for people like yourselves that you know are pushing pushing new kit, pushing people that are doing new stuff. You know, it's like I want to. You know, I'm busy, so when I can kind of you know look at look at what you're doing on LinkedIn, you know, look at some of the people that you're um, pushing forward. You know, it's exciting for me to kind of discover what people are doing in terms of with security and, you know, just new technology, you know, I, I, I need to keep an eye out for it. So, um, so yeah, te new technology supports me as much as I support that. So Ben Russo with Ben Russo designs is joining us today and Ben, you know, on your website, just an absolutely beautiful website. And I was going through there and looking at some of the portfolio that you've put together and, and I noticed that you were integrating a lot of technology with your furniture outside of lighting like there was uh, one gentleman's uh, home that you did where you did like a gentleman's club with uh, pink neon lights and then there was the other setup that looked like a two channel DJ booth that had lights emphasizing the the bookshelf speakers and yeah. then you had that emphasis of a, of a giant H with some wisdom speakers that were built in to either side of the television can you tell us a little bit more like, are, are you seeing clients wanting to in, uh, uh, integrate technology into your designs more? Or, or has it just been something that you've always had the ability to, to bring to the table of, hey, you know what, we can also do this with this design? Yeah, I think when um, I'm being commissioned to do something, people are aware that, you know, I have an understanding of, technology, lighting, control, audio, and all of that is a kind of bonus because fundamentally they want my aesthetic because, you know, I design in a certain way. I understand how materials are going to go together. Um, you know, I've built up a lot of knowledge of materials and manufacturing processes. So that's the given for what I do. And, you know, inevitably with the look that I'm creating something for, they get the bonus aspect of, well, I'm going to make sure that it works with this modern modern system that they've got in the house. And I'm either doing the, the whole house design and I'm creating a lighting scheme and I'm creating the custom furniture that goes in. And then because that's, that's when you get the best, the best kind of service from me, if I can design the whole house, because inevitably I can plan the lighting, I can plan the system, I can plan the control, I can plan how the audio is going to be used because my interiors are not just a, a modern functional home. They're kind of like an experience. So, you know, I, I kind of, it's a fun thing to do with the customer. You know, I do the, do a, do a journey, right? We walk through the front door. Okay. We walk through the front door and we've got this hallway. What do we see first of all? And it's like, look up. Okay. We've got a beautiful chandelier. The first thing we see is this kind of modern chandelier. So there's this experience of discovery and, you know, there's a way these things work and they're controlled. And it's like, okay, right, Mr. Customer, you press your first button and the house is in startup mode. So you've then got the, the first level of interior lighting features. So you've got some of these like recessed lighting pockets and some of the artworks light up. So you've got that first level of reveal. And um, so I think by designing or uh, by a customer, working with me that's you know they, they they get that security of knowing that these things are all going to work it's going to look good together and it's going to be practical and functional ben so. do you do you think that customers now thinking back 20 years ago are you dealing with more informed customers where we've got things like instagram pinterest house boutique hotels that they've stayed in you know they've absolutely you know they're they're, they're they've the access now to so much online are they coming to you with some firm thoughts on what they would like to achieve or are they still you know they'll give you their ideal scenario but then obviously handing it over to your creative thinking yeah i think there's some um, i certainly um getting a lot more of a customer that has actually done their research and is like you know what we've okay we're just invested in this new home and it doesn't have the lighting system that i want but i really know what i want you know i've seen something at a friend's house They've got something great. Now I've researched what I want. And, you know, they come to me with a pretty good idea of the kit and the way they want it to work. 
they just don't quite know how to integrate it. And so, you know, that's great for me because, you know, they're already ahead of the game. They understand what some of the difficulties could be. And um, so, yeah, certainly there's so much more information out there now that I think um, customers are very well informed. Um, but also there are other customers that, you know, still have no idea and they're still a bit afraid of it. But in general, I see a, I see a lot more um uh, people come to me with a with a good idea of, of of what's capable these days so you know you're a man of many talents and and design is obviously a big big focus of yours but you've also created some of your own designs that are that are timeless and one of them is is on the wall behind you there the wow. tempest timepiece collection can you tell us a little bit about what got you thinking about timepieces and and and, 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 and it's a, it, it, you've integrated one of your favorite elements, which is light. That's right. So, uh, you know, from furniture um, to, I, I call it kind of like wall decor and features, you know, uh, in some of my interiors, there's a lot of like fitted things that could be a shelving unit that has lighting in or there more of architectural elements. So there's like ceiling recesses with a, a beautiful tiled wall that, uh, that are illuminated. And it took a little while for me to create my own collection of, let's say, wall hung illuminated artworks. And I have a, I have a bit of a fetish for like repetitive geometry and, you know, really precision, um, precision, forms uh you know like patterns in nature you know like honeycombs and think you know it's you really look at some kind of macro detail in nature and i'm just i'm blown away by it and i basically started creating these artworks with 60 pieces of material that i would engrave or machine out of say there were discs so there were these round discs and the, the actual piece was this uh, collection that I was trying to create natural forms. And the, the first one was the iris. I was trying to create an iris, but using a CNC machine on a computer. So making a very machine perfect precision replication of something as beautiful as an iris. And to create the right amount of illuminated parts in a machined out piece of material, I kept coming to 60 pieces of material and as I was illuminating 60 pieces I or it was basically an array of 60 machined grooves in a circle and so these 60 pieces I was like you know what it just needs to animate it needs to be some kind of clock and it just I kept experimenting with repetitive forms and then it was like you know what there's just something about the illuminated detail is lovely as a static object but you know I always need to do something more and push myself and I you know, time, I feel, you know, time has never been more precious. And the, the idea of creating something beautiful to just watch time go by, it was kind of a, it kind of felt like a, a naughty thing to do because, you know, I don't have time, time to waste myself. Who has time to waste these days? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I created this clock made of time segments. So there's basically 132 channels of light. We have 12 hours around the outside, if you can see behind me. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is a background of a project I've done, but um, so this isn't actually animating right now, but um, there's 12 hour segments around the outside. Then there are 60 minutes around the, the middle layer, and then there is 60 seconds in the center. So it's a building pattern of light. So the first 60 seconds illuminate one by one by one until all 60 are lit and then the first minute will illuminate and so on. Then the cycle repeats until the hours build until all 12 hour segments are lit and all the minutes are lit and then it goes back to, it goes back round. So I can change the color on these. We can, can create beautiful patterns. I've, I've made sculptures um, and it's, 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 it's a, a beautiful part of the work, which I'm, you know, actually looking as a separate outlet for my work. You know, I, I, this time, the relationship between time and light is, is something really important. You know, we've moved from the age of um, the sundial, you know, we moved into the, 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 the analog clock and then you move into the digital clock. And now we're moving into, as I'm calling it, the kind of light clock, mm -hmm. which is representing time through patterns of light. So, 
I think it's uh, it was designing a clock for the digital generation, basically. And the Tempest, is that a commissioned piece? Is that something that people would have to request or is it something that, that you're, that's available to buy? They are, they're, they're available in limited editions. Um, they're currently made to order, but I am just about to start doing a proper limited collection. So they'll be available in either editions of 12 or 60. Um, so they're going to be limited edition pieces. And, and just to uh, get the, the, the proportions on that, what's, what's the kind of scale of, of, the, of the Tempest? So this, uh, this collection, they are 36 inches or 910 millimeters diameter. Um, so they were designed for big modern houses or commercial spaces, so for restaurants or hotels, um, and they can be brandable. Um, this one behind me has a carbon fiber face to it, um, but oh. I, uh, I'm, I'm creating these beautiful antique mirrored versions, which um, wow. are just absolutely stunning. And everyone is unique because of the way that antique mirrors are created. Mm. So uh, they have some beautiful gold and silver finishes in. So they kind of look really, really premium and beautiful. Well, you, you know, that that is a striking statement piece. But another one that caught my eye, and I've seen it so much on social media, you, you do a great job actually of, communicating your your designs is is the bubble chair this you know you know reinvented reimagination a classic design and you've really taken ownership of that and put your stamp all over it with three distinct uh types of bubble chair with the standing the hanging or the illuminated tell us about the bubble chair because people if you're listening to the podcast get on your website go to ben russo's website and and find this chair this is stunning Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I you know I used to be obsessed by the Jetsons. Do you remember the old Jetsons yeah. <laughs> program? Which you know I think of it as like the the seventies vision of the future. You know they had these flying cars and you know very modern interiors, and we haven't quite got there. You know their vision that was the vision of the twentieth century or the twenty first century, and um, they hadn't quite got there and. Well, we haven't quite got there. Uh, you know, the human race hasn't quite got there yet. I mean, there's advancements, but we're not there. And so furniture design, I've always loved that 70s era of futuristic design from the 70s. So the bubble chairs, um, you know, I think it's just one of the most iconic pieces of furniture. And, and doing, doing lots of stuff with acrylic and lighting when I was starting out, I was, um, you know, playing with how light would shine through acrylic and there's a guy jay drew who i met when i left school and uh, this is a funny story that um, we went to work on a boat in sweden and i was the kiddies entertainer so we had to kind of make blow up swords and stuff to welcome guests on and i dressed up as a clown because it was the only suit that fit me so i had this giant pointy hat on big silly outfit and jay was captain hook um, because the uh, the Robin, no, not, uh, what's his name? The Peter Pan outfit didn't fit me because I'm, I'm six <laughs> foot five. So I had to wear the silly clowns outfit. And uh, anyway, we were on this boat together for a month and we didn't know each other. He was a bit of a sci-fi freak as well. And we kind of really got talking and he was like an inventor. He would pull old photocopies apart, make these amazing machines. And he kind of introduced me to LEDs and he'd solder up little things and, you know, play with bits of plastic. And I was like, you know what, there's something, there's something in this. And I, at that point wanted to then get into film special effects. And I was thinking, you know, I want to make these little things. You know, I had a, always had an imagination. I was thinking futuristic uh, things. I want to, I want to make just cool things from the future. And so Jay led me into LEDs the furniture thing of loving bubble chairs, I thought, right, I'm going to design, I'm going to make my own illuminated bubble chair because I, I engineered a metal ring which had LEDs in it. And then I thought, well, how can I make it, you know, my piece? And so I created a, an artwork which we engraved into the, into the acrylic so that the, the light can shine through and has somewhere to, to, to pick up. So, um, the illuminated bubble chair, I think I first made in about 2006, maybe 2008. And um, it was an amazing piece, but it's, you know, there was a bit of a failure rate because the artwork can stretch and it's, it's a bit of an unknown science when you're thermoforming the acrylic. 
Um, but it looks stunning. I get so much attention from the illuminated chairs. Um, they're, they're really a special piece to do. And I, you know, I'm making one for someone in Switzerland at the moment. Um, so they'll have one of my flock artworks on. So it's taking, with that one, it's taking, you know, familiar patterns like a flock artwork, which is a classic pattern, and putting it on a very modern, futuristic piece. Um, so again, they're kind of a timeless looking, um, you know, they, 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 they look good from the 70s any, in any decade up until 2020, you know, and I, I'm yeah. sure they'll still look good. But um, the, 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 the innovation from the acrylic version is that, you know, they get damaged, they get scratched, and I wanted to make a more solid, robust version. So I, uh, again, coming back to my use of repeating geometries, made a, an array of metal wire profiles and just, you know, it's like I want to make a solid steel one, which still has that feeling of protection and, you know, that beauty of sitting in your own little cocoon. Um, but actually, when, when it's, because the acrylic bubble, you get an acoustic uh, feeling around you, but actually the wire version, the metal one, you don't get the sound, but you still feel this level of protection. You, you feel cocooned and safe. And, uh, but visually, you know, it still has the same kind of look as a bubble chair and because the profiles are fairly thin it allows light through so it doesn't feel too heavy a piece um, and so those were all hanging but then you know you realize well as a very small market of people who have got the ability to hang a chair so actually i design a leg for it because everyone's got a floor so yeah. you know suddenly i've got a much bigger market so um the, the the floor standing version evolved from the hanging version and the metal version evolved from the acrylic version so um yeah, I'm just about to launch a new set here in the States. You know, I think I launched them in uh, England at 100% design in 2014. And uh, they got uh, a lot of attention, but it was just a hard thing to, um, hard thing to cash flow. And, you know, I, I had a certain quantity I needed to do and I got busy with other big interior projects and uh, the nature of my work is custom one-off pieces. So, you know, to change that business model to actually produce my own products um, has been a it's, it's taken a while to get to, to, to get the right supply chain and you know really understand the right uh, method um, because I'm trying to make these things more affordable a lot of the custom things I do you know you work with a customer to give them exactly what they want that's been the nature of my business but you know people often say oh I love that you know how much is one of those and yeah. you know sometimes they're too expensive for that person but so I'm trying to make make them as affordable as possible and that means you know making more at once of the same thing you know it's making things in volume or some volume because they're still uh, they're handmade in europe so they're you know they're, they're, they're high quality items but i'm just making more of them than one or two which is you know what i normally do so yeah they'll be coming to the market soon so uh, the, the the shop hopefully by the time this podcast goes live the shop will be ready and you'll be able to order them online at benrusso.com yeah, we'll put that in the show notes for sure. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, whenever I was looking at those chairs uh, and seeing your use of acrylic as well as light, I also noticed that uh, you did something with the Chelsea Flower Show. And yeah. you did a really cool display with acrylic and, and light and the whole infinity well. Explain That's that it. to our audience because that, that was super cool. Yeah, so that um, I was asked by uh, a garden design company called the LDC and they were working for the Royal National Institute of the Blind and so they had created a scheme called the the mind's eye and it was all about creating a, a, a simulation experience that someone with sight could experience to feel almost a little afraid as if you know a blind person might you know if they're walking and they could step off a curb or something, you know, that experience of, you know, the fear that they might be falling or something. And it was, it was about a modern central garden that people could experience both with sight and without sight. And the focus was this huge infinity light tunnel that sat inside a, a glass waterfall. And so it had to work in the daytime. So I think they were, I think there were 10 watt LEDs and I think there was about 40 of them on each side. Um, so there was 160 
uh, 10 watt LED. So this thing was so bright, you know, if, if it was sunny outside, you still had to be able to see the infinity effect in this uh, light well. And effectively it was a, I think it was a 36 mil layer of glass over a metal frame, which was only actually six inches deep. But the visualist aspect of it was like this huge tunnel that was going down for miles <laughs> and it was supposed to look, you know, scary. It was supposed to kind of give people a little bit of a shock that it was only six inches deep, but it looked like it was 60 feet deep and you really didn't know whether you were stepping into a hole and were just going to disappear down the hole. So it was this kind of crazy sensory, uh, sensory experience. And they asked me to get involved because of my work with lighting and some of my infinity artworks that I've produced before. And the real challenge was sunlight because, you know, anyone that works with lighting knows you can't compete with the sun, especially outside, directly underneath the sun. So, you know, we had a bit of protection from this glass. There was basically a glass shroud around the, the, the infinity mirror that you could stand inside, but it had a waterfall over it. So it was a beautiful modern garden that these, um, the LDC guys have designed. Um, but the, the, the focus of the sensory experience was you walked in, stood on this tunnel, and, you know, it was to kind of stimulate your yeah create a reaction but it was hard you know we had to use these super bright leds which you know literally burn your eyeballs out if you were to kind of look at it at night time but you know in the daytime it, it had to deliver this wow factor effect so um you know it was it, it was it was a fun piece um but um the uh, and i'll tell you a story as well is that the uh, the contractors who were installing it i delivered it on the, the day of the show when i was supposed to and I deliberately didn't leave the transformer because I didn't want them plugging it in or messing around with it. And it had the wires on it and they wired it to the mains and oh. instead of the transformer and blew up a load of LEDs on it. So uh, oh I was so angry that they'd done it because they wanted to test it out. And uh, so uh, luckily only two or three uh, died and they were on the same light side. So the photography shows all of the LEDs intact <laughs> from view. So I'm, um, pleased that we didn't have to take it apart and uh, the whole thing was ruined but you know they they nearly ruined it before it even went live and uh, they won they won a gold medal for it so um it was and know. normally normally ben would be impressed by a gold medal but as, as i dug through your website something else impressed me more you represented the uk at the world fire sculpting competition i want to know what that is i'm gonna look it up on youtube later tell me what this was yeah, so uh, this was a fun thing. Uh, I've done some work at the Ice Hotel, um, which is up in Arctic, Sweden. And I created a few rooms there. Um, amazing bunch of people that I've met. Some of the coolest artists I've met from around the world, you know, from all every corner of the world. And um, some of the group, they're, 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 they're sculptors and artists, and they travel the world doing stone sculpting, sand sculpting. and I was invited by my network through the Ice Hotel to come and do something at the at the fire sculpting competition. Now, you know, in England, it's probably not a big thing, but in kind of Eastern Europe and in kind of Scandinavia, it's kind of, it's a pretty big thing. And they make these huge hay and timber sculptures and set fire to them. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a new thing to me. And, you know, there was no one involved in you from the uk so they invited me um to do it and um i created you know like i do with you know i love to use light and shadow and texture so i designed this huge huge crisscross um form and it had this hanging hanging um cube inside which dangled down so it looked like it was floating so when you set fire to it there was this floating spinning uh, cube I mean it really was to kind of you know mess with your mind you know I, I wanted to do something really interesting geometric uh, because a lot of the other artists they kind of make very cool you know like a roaring horse or a you know a dragon or something kind of quite classic and they're, they're brilliant some of them are you know uh, but I, I thought you know my, from I did a bit of research before I before I submitted my design and I you know I thought all right, actually what what I don't see much of is this very geometric kind of more of a mathematical puzzle. So um, I uh, created this thing that looked like a floating sphere inside a, a frame 
And when it was on fire, you just had this glowing ball inside something. And uh, yeah, it was great fun. You know, we had like a week out there building this giant thing and timber and hay. And then you've got a big ceremony where everyone comes to watch on the side of a river. And uh, it was like a frozen river bank. So yeah, the, the river was frozen. Um, but it was dry on the side, there was no snow, but uh, yeah, it was a great experience in Latvia and I think across Eastern Europe and uh, you know, they have this competition every year in different places and uh, yeah, I much, say the much... world fire sculpting, but it, you know, that's what they said, it was the world fire sculpting competition, so you know. It's I'll much cooler, much cooler than some of the things in the UK. What, what have we right. got? We've got like rolling a cheese wheel down a hill, we've got bog <laughs> snorkeling, we got some. We got some wacky stuff, but fire sculpting really caught my attention. We have washer throwing contest around here. <laughs> Sounds great fun. No, you know. no, nowhere near as cool as uh, you know burning burning your sculpture. Although all that hard work, I, I'd be like, oh man, I can't stand to see it go. I mean, that's that's got to be well, tough. That's, that's it's actually. Um, from the ice hotel, um, because the hotel itself melts every year and they create a new one. And from doing that the first time, you kind of, um, you get this unusual satisfaction of knowing that you've borrowed from the river and then you're giving back to it. So you're kind of recycling your art, but you know that it's only going to be available for one season. So the guests will only be able to visit that room and that design for one season and then it will never exist again. So, you know, there's a, a kind of a very special romance um, with people who got to stay in the room that year. And as an artist, you build your room and then you stay in it. So you're the first people to stay in the, the, the frozen room and the temperature stays a constant kind of minus eight inside. Um, I've been there some years and it's been like minus 40 outside. So, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty hardcore. And... Uh, uh, but it's fun and uh, you know working with ice is, is super fast you've got these super sharp chisels chainsaws and the way lighting works inside you know for me it was a dream and uh, the, the story how I came to going to the ice hotel is when I uh, decided to propose to my wife I was researching somewhere special to take her and the ice hotel came 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 up somehow on google or whatever it was and uh then I was amazed by all these, the lighting in the ice of these rooms. And I was like, oh my God, I need to see this place. So, you know, as much as I was taking my wife somewhere to propose to her, it was actually a, Field you trip. know, a bit of a jaunt to see some cool lighting design. And uh, when we first arrived, uh, we got there and I sent my wife to the bar and said, you know, just go and grab yourself a, a, a glass of wine. And I'm going for a quick meeting and a tour of the factory with the, with the <laughs> architects and, uh, they had this full-size Formula One car in the in the in the workshop and all this crazy stuff, and I was like, "Oh my god!" So, after I proposed to my wife and she said yes, in my wedding speech, I did say, "Well, you know, now I've proposed at the Ice Hotel. I'm hoping that next year they'll they'll accept my proposal because you know you have to enter as a competition, and they they go through a big board of uh, other designers, and they they you know they 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 choose you basically." out of your proposal. So the next year I did thankfully get accepted and I designed a room at the Ice Hotel and you know, you, I was thinking, how, how do I feel about my creation just disappears after a certain time, but uh, you kind of get, get your head around and it's a really nice story that you know, someone, only a select few people get to share it or experience it. And then you, know, you can do it again the next year or that design changes. And so the photography is obviously very important, you know, documenting, the work is that's 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 important so you have got some record but then doing the fire sculpture it kind of introduced me to this world of temporary work um you know uh, which you kind of get in the exhibition world you know you build a design an exhibition stand it goes up for a weekend it gets you know it gets a hard life because you've got hundreds of thousands of people coming over the event over the weekend and half gets destroyed and then you pull it down and it effectively goes in the bin whereas the rest of my work, I try to make it built to last. You know, if I'm designing interior stuff, it's, it's you know, I, I'm really against that throwaway um, lifestyle of, you know, you buy, you know, Ikea I think is brilliant. I name Ikea, but I think it's, it's a great thing, but some stuff is just so cheap. People get used to think, oh, I'll just buy another one and I'll damage that, you know, as I wish people would look after things more or, you know, and, spend that little bit more money to have something of real good quality and make it last. You know, I, I, 
I really feel that there's too much of a throwaway uh, yeah. nature about people in this day and age, which is a shame. Definitely a disposable culture. Um, yeah. But also that buy cheap, buy twice for sure is never never goes out of fashion that saying on your website like i was saying earlier i see that you are integrating a lot of audio and video for some of your clients and that it's been a really important part of integrating into your design do you have any tips for home technology professionals when working with designers uh, anything that should be considered or you know how to make that uh, relationship more of a bond uh, how do you get them to visualize what you're trying to design yeah, I think there's a you know the it, timing is one thing that you know a customer might not know the best way to put the right people together so you know there's a point where the customer needs to have the right designer in mind and the designer needs to have the right person to work with for the installation of the equipment so that the the, the solution for the customer is what they want because you know, it's hard for the customer to kind of know who he needs to bring in at the right time. Um, so, you know, how, how could I help that? How could I offer that advice? Well, if, if, you know, if I'm looking at it from, I'm the design point of view. So, you know, I would always want to make sure that I understand what the customer wants specifically. And I really want to understand how they want to use something. And then I want to speak with my, let's say my techie and who is going to help me on the consult on the, let's say the audio side, the equipment side, they're going to deliver the installation. I want to work very closely with them so that we can tick all the boxes on the brief of the customer because we want to deliver what they want. And then also using our expertise and our imagination, give them something a little bit more. So, you know, there's always that, there's that wow factor. So they've got the user experience of what they want. So their TV, let's say it's a home cinema they've got their screen the projector works in the way it does the audio works in the way it does the lighting you know the way it all comes to life in kind of the click of a few buttons it's making that experience super easy for them um so i think it's the the best thing is is communication you know i think make sure that uh, you've got your your team lined up and you communicate well so that you're you're all clear of what you're going to do before you start the execution. So, uh, you know, as a designer, I would want to make sure that I'm delivering what a customer wants. And I want to make sure that my, my techie or my, uh, you know, my, my the, the, the company that I'm working with are on the same level as me to give the customer exactly what they want. And, you know, that's anything from the equipment we're going to use to obviously a budget, you know, we might be working to a budget and it's what is the best equipment we can deliver for this budget um, so you know communication is key make sure you're communicating with your team and if you don't have your team find the team research the people you want to work with um, yeah you know look 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 at look at Chris Gamble look at his uh, his uh, the information that he's regularly putting out on his LinkedIn feeds you know it's a great source of information and someone like him would be very very helpful to assist you with putting your team together I oh, appreciate that. Appreciate that, Ben. Um, and and I got to to meet you a few years ago when you were working in the UK, and you're working with a close friend of both of ours, Alan, Alan Treacher at Harpenden Electrical. And that was a I saw a collaboration there where you were relying on his technical expertise and his electrical experience, and Absolutely. you know his his uh, you know his problem solving abilities as well. You know, so that team is is crucial. And uh, I saw some f fantastic projects he did and. A massive chandelier. I think it was in the Ukraine or Russia. Yeah, and so. I remember following that on the early days of Instagram. Alan doing a, some posts on that, and it was um, the height and the scale of this uh, lighting fixture was, was incredible. Yeah, and you know that that for me is that's the prime example of having your team knowing who you know you can rely on. So you know I come at it with the design aspect you know i've got an idea of what i want to use in terms of the lighting equipment but then you know i know i can rely on alan and harpenton electrical for giving me their knowledge and know-how they know you know you need to have a relationship so he you know he's learned to build up he knows what my style is going to be and he know he can kind of preempt as you get working together more more and more you you can second guess how best to work together so you know when when i got that inquiry I was first thinking actually I'd design a, a fiber optic piece and 
you know, I knew that fiber optic wouldn't give me enough of a wow factor in the daytime when this big piece needed to be lit. So um, it was then using a mains, you know, very simple kind of globe lights. And then I had these metal balls that would reflect the light. So actually we didn't need so much quantity of lighting because these metal balls would effectively give you reflection and volume in this chandelier. And so when I came up with the idea, you know, I, I, needed, I, I needed some help. Alan came into the workshop with me, helped wire the whole thing together. We, first of all, we planned it all, obviously. So, you know, the planning aspect we do before we then submit the designs to the customer. So, you know, I've got an idea in my head. I put it together in 3D on a computer. Uh, then, you know, have a good chat with Alan. We work out, you know, what sort of power consumption we're going to need, what's, how we're going to wire it together what sort of assembly and you know put some costs to it and then once we've kind of ironed that out present that to the customer then they can agree it or not but you know they did agree it and then we had to work out what's the logistics of getting into um it was crimea actually so okay. you know getting into crimea when a lot of other people just wouldn't travel there so you know there was a you know there was travel restrictions and and we thought oh god you know what's you know how's this going to work out but you know, Alan, like me, you know, he's pretty gung ho with stuff. So it was, uh, it was a fun challenge to do, and it, it looked amazing when it yeah. was done. It absolutely looked amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's a fun thing. But you know, build your team, get you know, work, do develop your team. You know, make sure you kind of build that relationship because it only gets easier to um, deliver a better project. You know, I, I only want to. Uh, deliver you know I want my customers to be blown away you know I just want them to love what I'm doing for them and you know inevitably I need the best people to help me put these things together you know I need bring in the other expertise to work with my creative vision so that's that's the thing is you know and look, and look research for what you're, you're you're looking to do what's been the what's been the biggest differences for you from you know nearly 15 plus years working in the UK and then relocating family work everything life to to the west coast of the united states what's been the big difference uh, for you working out there um you know one thing is yeah my my suppliers and the other you know as i talk these these the specialist people that can help me produce stuff you know i have to effectively i'm finding them from scratch and those those guys you know they're my good guys and they take a long time to find you know you you it, it you know, it just takes there's a bit of trial and error and they, these, these people don't just grow on trees. So, you know, I had a, a very special team that I was close to in the UK and I'm slowly building and finding some new people here. You know, there are experienced people here. I would say there's a lot of bad people. You know, there's a lot of cheap labor. There's a lot of people building houses. And, um, you know, in the West Coast where we are, there is a lot of a lot of homes, a lot of big expensive homes, and there's a lot of, there's not enough labor. So, you know, there's a, inevitably there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a bit of crummy labor in between. So, you know, I see some bad jobs. I see people um, that the hardest thing I've had is that the lighting designs that I've been creating, like these, let's say they're like LED details with mm -hmm. recessed, they're so they're, let's call them architectural details and in interiors with lighting. And, uh, contractors are saying yeah yeah we understand that and then you know come to check up on a job and they really haven't understood the drawings and they're you know they're just saying yes yes we can do that but then they don't actually understand how to don't quite understand what they're doing and um, I've said to I've said to JJ in the past about European lighting game is so far ahead with our yeah. you know extra low voltage fixtures our, our hidden lighting our recessed lighting um, and JJ and his business has started to recently be more involved with lighting. He's been tapping into my experiences with using strip lighting and 24 volt, 12 volt lighting. And it, I'm surprised, you know, when I visited the States as well for trade shows is how far, probably I'd say about a decade behind it feels would, like to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would absolutely support that. So, you know, I see it for my business is that's a good thing because, sure. you know, I'm, I want to be a, ahead of the game i want to be bringing this to people um you know not to be greedy but i, I want to you know i want to help lead the way and if i can you know whatever i can do to ed educate other people is great you know i want to work with some cool architects who are pushing the latest design um so it just inevitably helps me because people don't see it so often so um you know i really think there's a missing 
you know, the, there's, a, there's an amount of education. You know, there's, there are some people doing some very cool stuff. Absolutely, no doubt. I mean, here in, you know, we're near, I'm in Manhattan Beach, you know, there's people building some big expensive houses and we've got friends who are selling properties, you know, and some of the things up the hills, you know, they're building a hundred million dollar super mansions, you know, and it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. There's money, but you know, I, I, I just see there's a need for more expertise. You know, they're just, it, they're behind no, no two ways about it, but yeah, that's good. Uh, Alan, Alan and myself will be on the next plane. Yeah, <laughs> please do. Please come over. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Yeah, Chris has been trying to find a way to convince the entire family. Let's just pack it up and relocate to the States. Uh, man, I'd, I'd love for him to come to the States. Absolutely. You know, ben, it, it's been it's been wonderful hearing from you. You know, we, we have one question that we ask all of our guests that come on the show, and and that's, you know, outside of the technology that you're working with on a regular basis, is there one technology device that you just can't live without? Something that you must have from home to home? I mean, you know, the, the, the thing I rely on is, is obviously the wireless router, you know, because it's kind of helping me control my, we got the camera, the security cameras for the house, there's the audio for the house, there's the lighting. Um, you know, it allows me to operate my business. So, I mean, it's the, 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 the most least exciting item, you know, is a, is a Wi-Fi router, I'm afraid. So, you know, it's, uh, that's, you know, we're so reliant on it. And if I had, um, if I had to say what's my favorite gadget in the house, I would say it's my digital front door lock. Um, you know, that's quite a fun, that's a, that's a piece of kit that I just, really like not having to carry a front door key around and i like the the door lock we've not had that before jj and yeah. the router we've always talked about the wireless router being the just that essential no you know cannot, foundation for you everything can't bypass that is that is that's crucial yeah we've had a fantastic chat with ben we've talked about the early days the traveling around the globe as a postgraduate um you know getting opportunities to exhibit at shows then coming up with his own iconic designs uh, doing ice sculptures, fire sculptures, amazing journey through, through the, you know, the, the, the experiences Ben's had over the, the last nearly 20 years as a, as a designer. It's, it's been fantastic. And some of the stories have been great. And, you know, Ben, just at the end there, just share with us, where can people find out about you? Maybe you've got something upcoming. I know this year has been a disruption for all of us, but is there something coming up and where can people find out about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, my Instagram or my, um, my website, uh, benrusso.com, is uh, it's getting a little bit of a facelift on stuff, and I've got some new artwork that's going to be coming out soon, um, just as we've been, you know, in lockdown, I'm uh, still working on projects and trying to do some stuff in the garage that uh, workshop stroke, you know, just playing with new things that are actually a bit more accessible and just fun, you know, just uh, so there's new artwork to look out for. Um, there's a new range of timepieces. So they'll be coming, uh, they'll be coming soon. And I will be uh, posting those through my Instagram. Um, so that's under Ben Russo art and design or Ben underscore Russo underscore art underscore design. Um, and, um, what have I got coming up in the future? I mean, I'm, I went to Burning Man last year, created a cool sculpture there with a, an architect, Alex Hoare, um, and uh, from Atmos Studio in London. Uh, that was really fun. And I'd like to do my own kind of timepiece sculpture, which kind of might be a, some kind of solar powered or wind powered sculpture that I'll set up there and be a beautiful lighting based timepiece. So yeah, if uh, Burning Man is open next year, then, uh, that's kind of on the radar and potentially some public art, you know, public lighting art, you know, that's something that I'm really interested in and the, the lighting festival. So, you know, I did a, I did something at the Canary Wharf light festival. Um, that must've been three years ago. I had some of the clocks there and I would love to do more with these lighting sculpt, you know, the lighting shows in the, the big cities around the world. So, um, that's something I just want to add some, put some more energy into because, uh, I'd love to do it. I, I love the interaction with public and, you know, just creating these, these beautiful 
things for people to experience. You know, I love, I love the, the, the interaction. I think it's a, it's a really fun thing from all ages, from kids to youngsters to elderly people. You know, it's a different reaction. But um, yeah, I just don't have time for everything. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm kind of my own enemy by doing too many things. So <laughs> the light sculptures is something that's, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my neck out and you'll be seeing some stuff in the next year or so. We're watching. So keep an We're eye watching. out. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Russo, for joining us today. And uh, friends, please go to his website. Check him out on LinkedIn. Check him out on Instagram as well. As we close out the show, as we do every time, if you don't know, ask a home tech pro. Thanks so much, guys. It's lovely talking to you. A lot of fun. Perfect. Really enjoyed it.